Welcome to Vector. Three, two, one, action. Hello, everyone. This is Peter Gregorio. Welcome to the Vector Interview Podcast. Each episode focuses on a different artist. We meet in person and have an in depth discussion about life, art, and the concepts behind their work. Today's episode is with the German artist Alina Grossman. Alina Grossman is a realist painter based in Munich. She creates large scale, site specific compositions that blur the line between fact and fiction. Her works are inspired by a specific film or piece of literature, which then takes her on a journey of exploration, where she researches places and then visits them in real life, recording her experiences and the atmosphere through photographs. Drawn to the narratives of each place, she compares the reality and sensation of the place with the way she imagined it would be then makes interventions by changing or adding objects or erasing parts. Rather than illustrating existing myths about a place, she aims to create a space of association so new stories emerge. I first met Alina when I was in Munich doing an artist residency at Ebenbach House. I was working on putting together a Munich edition of Vector Artist Journal We actually connected on Instagram, um, and I set up a studio visit. She was good friends with the New York-based artist Jesus Benevente, who she had done the NARS Foundation residency in Brooklyn with. He invited her to a performance he was doing. We had done the launch at the Whitney Museum, and they wanted us to do more than just launching the journal so they had us put together a performance series so we took um, eight of the artists who were in the journal who were performative in their practice and Jesus was one of the performers so he invited her to the opening and when I went to do a studio visit with her I, I didn't know her but we were talking and I was telling her about me and what I was doing there And she was like, oh yeah, I was at the performance. <laughs> and I was like, oh wow, that's kind of amazing. And she actually had a copy of the journal in her studio. So we talked about her work, The Montauk Project, which was inspired by the books Homo Faber and Montauk by Max Frisch. This series explored the interior architecture of Montauk, which is a town uh, at the tip of Long Island, um, outside of New York City. It's very familiar to me because I would go there when I was a boy. And um, so when I looked at these images, there was something that resonated with me on a personal level. A conspiracy theory of the same medium alleges that secret government experiments were conducted there to develop psychological warfare techniques and esoteric research, including time travel, teleportation, mind control contact with their own life and stage room landings. Grossman depicts hauntingly deserted restaurants, hotels, and vantage points in and around the town. Uh, after talking with her and looking at her work, I invited her to be one of the contributing artists for the Vector Issue 9 Munich edition. At the time, I didn't have my equipment with me, so I couldn't do the interview then. We wound up meeting at a solo show two months ago that she was doing in New York City at the Friedman Gallery and talking about her new series called Sculpting in Time. Sculpting in Time is the name of the creative manifesto written by the Russian filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky. Bizarre dreams are set against the backdrop of an experimental desert town of Arcasante, Arizona a site of visionary utopia, a relic that embodies its future as well as its past. Inside its rooms, Grossman leads the viewer through an imaginarium of items and objects arranged as a cabinet of curiosities that reject clear symbolism, lending the scenes to be explored and filled with subjective meaning. We talked about the exhibition, the film by Tarkovsky, Solaris, the nostalgia of objects, 
and the surreal interiors of her paintings. Welcome, Alina Grossman. This is Vector. When you're ready, just say who you are, where you're from, and why we're here. Don't think of the audience, it's just me. Okay. So. My name is Alina Grasman and I'm a painter from Munich. And at the moment I'm in New York because I'm having a solo show at Friedman Gallery. And we meet because we know each other from the Vector launch in Munich from last year. <laughs> Welcome. Wow, it's wild that you're here. And I'm pretty psyched that we're able to meet. You know, I saw on Instagram actually that you're having a solo show. And I was like, now? You know? <laughs> I guess you arranged this a while ago, probably. Yes, I, I've been planning this show for over one year now. So I, actually, all these paintings here um, were painted since September 2019. That's when I started to do it. So this was like the plan for such a long time, but then everything was so uncertain suddenly because of the virus. And yeah, but I don't know exactly how this happened, but I could come here and be here for the opening and and for a little bit longer, so I'm happy about this. <laughs> yeah, are you happy about it? Yeah. Even I, though um, things are kind of shut down and obviously it's not like a lot of people are coming to openings. So. Yes, yeah, that's true. But, yeah, it's so what? it's still better here because in Munich, it, we, I mean, I left Munich right before there was the second lockdown. So here it's still a little life and in Munich my studio is not that big so I had never seen all my paintings hanging together in one room and for me this was very important to just be in this room at least one time and see all the paintings that I was working on for so long, see, see them there installed and like all together. Isn't it? It's so fulfilling, isn't it? Like when you're working on things, just to see them all hung and arranged, it's just one of the most fulfilling things, I think, right? Yeah, I so. don't, I, I think it brings something kind of to an end when, because I, I remember when the creators picked up the paintings in my studio in Munich and I wasn't sure if I would be able to go here. It was, I kind of fe felt so empty, like my babies are gone. <laughs> so I can imagine. <laughs> I'm so glad you came because I think you're right, like to come here and see this, I mean, it looks perfect. And we're in the gallery right now and it just looks perfect. and. Um, just to stand here alone, I imagine, and kind of walk around and look at your work and see how they play off of each other. I've been to your studio, so I know your studio well, in that weird bridge yeah. <laughs> tunnel, and it, the they bridge. get shorter and shorter. <laughs> I liked your studio, though. But I, I, you know, last time I saw your work, yeah, they were all stacked against the walls, and though, I mean, this, they look so good. Wow. Thank you. I'm glad you came, you made that choice. You probably were unsure, right, if you were, even the show was going to happen at yeah. some point. Because um, like no one could tell me this. Uh, yeah. I'm like more like a person, I always want to know everything exactly so I can plan and this was like not possible to do any plans this year and this was kind of yeah. exhausting but still I I think I can't complain because still this year was okay for me because not so much changed like I'm working 
alone in my studio you work alone every time. Anyway. Yeah. I actually talked to some people about this, how artists are kind of used to this, having to Safe. sort of face their own mind, yeah. you know, <laughs> alone in the studio, face the void. Yeah, but still, I do the same as always, but normally you have the possibility to go out and see people, and if this is not possible anymore, it's kind of creepy, scary situation. Like, Even if it like your paintings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you think so? <laughs> oh yeah. You think they're scary? Oh yeah. <laughs> don't you? I don't know. I actually I try to just give a room for anyone to fill with thoughts and and stories, so I like that you think oh, that. Oh yeah, they're very, I find them haunting and beautiful and lyrical and mm, um, surreal. They're also familiar to me. I wonder what it's like for somebody who, you know, has never been up to Montauk or in these kind of spaces, these interior spaces with the view out the window. It must be different, right, if you've never stood there and seen that light or felt that kind of ambiance in the room. Like every room has a certain kind of ambiance, right? A certain flair. Uh, flair is not the right word, I don't like that word. A certain like mood. I think you capture the mood really well and then you kind of enhance all the subtle absurdities of these spaces. Yeah, actually this is something I would try to do. I'm painting a room that exists like this, but I change things, so it, I, I want to blur the line between fact and fiction a little bit and just to, to um, show my feeling or my idea of the room before and while I was experiencing the place, which is sometimes not the same like the reality. And this is what I'm trying to do. So if I, if you say I captured the mood, maybe that's good yeah. <laughs> because it's close to, to what I, what I'm trying to do with the paintings. There are like two series in the exhibition. The, the large scale works are actually from Arizona desert and all the others are from Montauk. Yeah, because I was looking at this one and this one and I didn't see those. Yeah. They are different. Where were you? These are um, from an utopian experimental town. It's called Akosanti, and mm -hmm. it's in the Arizona desert, close to Phoenix. Um, it was built in the 70s by Paolo Soleri, who is a student of Frank Lloyd Wright. And it's funny because um, he had like this huge project, and Till today, I think only 1% of his plans have been built. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's kind of an ongoing project because you can go there and you can help building the city. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of a ruin because it's like no one's really living there or like it's, it's just this crazy utopian architecture. but not functioning in the way it should function so for me it's kind of a ruin and an ongoing project and still this uh, vision for the future so for me all the times come together in in this place just because of what it is this is was also um, one of the points why we would choose sculpting and time as a title for the exhibition and for the series. 
how did you wind up going there? How did you hear about it? Um, um, my very good friend lives in Arizona and I was visiting her for New Year's from 2017 to 2018 and she knew that I'm obsessed with these strange places and with architecture and so she took me there and I spent one day there and I knew that this is very interesting for me and that um, I would like to do something with this place and that's why I went back there last year in 2019 and I took some days and just went around the city and took photos and tried to find some inspiration. So you go to the place and you kind of walk around and it's almost like uh, you're mining or researching, collecting images and I imagine you're reflecting on... It, it's sort of a strange thing I think I grew up in a photography family and there's something when you have that intention to go out on that quest where you're taking photos your mind kind of goes into this other mode where you're you're like taking things in and you become sensitive to your surroundings and then each person it's unique what um, inspires them when you're walking around in that mode, what are you looking for? I know it's probably intuitive, but think about it. Like, what do you think you're looking for, if you had to kind of put it into words? Mm. I think, yeah, as you said, it's very intuitive, and everything is kind of determined for the compos to the composition of the paintings in the end, but what I'm looking for for mostly is like just the plain room that I can fill with, with like stuffs, objects and everything. So all these rooms do exist, but not like, like exactly like I painted them. For example, in this one, Sculpting in Time 3, so I also changed walls. The, I think this is like the biggest, um, I don't know how to say this right now. It's the painting where I changed m most from the original room because I moved like the wall on the left of the painting isn't existing. Okay. And the garden with the, with the plants it's actually on the other side, but more in the front. So I, I, this is not very often that I really change the architecture, but in this case, I really wanted to have the round window in the middle, and uh, I just wanted to have this very strong perspective. So I did this. But normally yeah. I would not change the architecture. I, what could happen to me would be to find a perfect room that I can just fill up. And sometimes you need to compose it yeah. yourself. Like you'll take a collection of different images that'll then be your kind of toolbox that you can draw from to compose the Im composition. And yeah. And I get that. That's very clear in these. But there's a certain mood that you're gravitating towards or attracted to and I can feel like you push it in a certain direction. What is that mood? Yeah, and that's a difficult it's question. It's subconscious, <laughs> I know, but I want to try to like, I ask myself these questions too, so like what do you think it is about that mood? I think often there is like the inside perspective and the out side perspective visible both at the same time at the same time the light is special in most of the situations all my paintings are empty from there are no humans in the paintings so 
I always think when you have these kind of interior shots and there's no figures in the painting, then you're kind of forcing the viewer to be the figure in the painting. Yeah, that's what I'm trying. And it, from from my from me from from my perspective, you then putting me as the I'm the mind, I'm the view, I'm not the viewer of the painting, but I'm like the the mind in the story, in the sort of existential aloneness, you know. <laughs> you can. You have said this really beautiful. <laughs> I like that you... I do notice this sort of balance between light, time of day. It's like dusk, so it's like going to be night. Maybe this morning it's going to be the day. Um, like it's inside and it's outside. You're always playing with these two opposites and you're finding this line in between. And it's almost like the whole composition is a collection of two opposites, finding the lines where it's gray or where it blurs. And you put it all together and then the whole thing is in that gray zone and, yeah, and, and it's haunting. <laughs> I tried even, you know, these are all inspired by the creative manifesto of the Russian filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky. So this book of him is called Sculpting in Time. That's where the title comes from too. I went to Akrasanti with my friend and I thought this architecture looks somewhat like a space station or more like what they would make a space station look like in an old science fiction movie. So it's not like a functioning space station, it's more like this film setting. And after that I, was, I watched Solaris by Tarkovsky and somehow this came together in my mind. Um, yeah, and I tried to combine the architecture, the, this utopian project by Paolo Soleri with some of the ideas or the concept of the films of Tarkovsky in my painting. For example, in Solaris, um, the researchers on the, on the space station, they surround themselves with objects that are treasures to humans, like because they did this or invented them, like sculptures and paintings and books. And I, I, in some of the painting, these things do appear, like the Bruegel painting I put in there. It plays a important role in the, in the movie too. And sometimes I, I try to arrange the the china on the on the table it's arranged in the same composition like in the room of the movie but the china for example is my mom's fr and like it's from my childhood memory so it's a personal thing for me but i try to put it in the setting of the movie you know what i mean yeah it takes time right to really in, some, in a painting like this and the elements you're describing to me that you're putting in there to really construct what you're going to do. There's a lot of thinking required. This is funny because like my idea are sometimes like there one year before I start painting. So I'm still finishing some other series, but I still am working in my mind on the next series. So maybe I would already take some photos in the place if I have the chance to go there. And then I have the photos and I would look at them from time to time and think what I'm going to do and what interventions I would make. So when I actually start painting, 
everything is planned. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And I'm similar like that. So at the very end, the making of it, I've already kind of worked it out, which is a lot of artists don't do that. But I love the slowness of your process. I think it really gives the work a lot of depth. The fact that it's not just like you, you could just take a photograph and paint it and boom, right? But it's not like that. I don't feel that in these. I feel like there's an exploration. I want to go back to Solaris. <laughs> I don't want, Yeah, I just don't want to. It's so easy for us to move <laughs> yeah. away. Um, I just wanted to say yeah, the, the, that it takes so long to. I mean, I need like one to two months for one painting, and like all the work in my head before. So this is like the third reason for mm -hmm. the title, for the sculpting in time. This was like, and in the series, always like kind of three things come together. The place is in the past, in the present, and in the future somehow, because it's kind of a ruin and it's an ongoing project at the same time and still there's this vision for the future and then there is like another thing where three things come together it's like the vision or the concept of the city itself and then there are the ideas of Tarkovsky and like my very personal memories that I tried to bring in. Yeah, and then just... Did Tchaikovsky bring his personal thing? Like, can we talk about what is it about, say, that film like Solaris? Did he bring his own personal things into the film? And was there something in the way he filmed it yeah. that sort of resonated with you? Yeah, what I, um, I mean, like all his writing is about film, it's not about painting. So I can't like take his words and just say this is for painting, but some ideas I think work in both media, such as if you bring, if you put an object in an image, I, I'd say, um, and this object is like very important for yourself and it's, it has a personal meaning. It's not really a symbol, but the viewer can probably feel that there is a certain story to the object that is just placed in the image. And this I really liked. I really uh, like the idea of just bringing a feeling to a painting or a s film scene with an object that is not really a symbol but could work not as a symbol but as like a blank space. I, I don't know how to say it better but... Well that object already has it, it this embedded meaning for the person, for you, say. Yeah, for example. Like if, if that's your family's china. Yes. It has yeah. embedded meaning. It has its own story already yeah. inside it that nobody really knows about, but I think it comes through. Yeah, and I, I, normally, I mean, we are talking like in depth, so I would tell you this, but normally I would not like... Uh, I think the best thing would be if I would not explain anything and it, someone feels something when he, he or she sees the painting, it's okay and I'm happy with this. It doesn't, I'm, I don't need to force like a certain feeling or anything. Mm -hmm. if, if someone feels something, I'm happy. Yeah, I don't need to know. It's really for you as the artist. I don't need to know. I will feel something. At least the way I feel personally, I think it's for you. you know. But I think that when you put these, like in gaming they call it Easter eggs, 
Have you ever heard that term? No. Easter eggs. Easter eggs? Yeah. In gaming, they'll put um, little secret things in the game that you can find. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called an Easter egg. And the developer will put it in there. There's no reason for it to be there. There's, but somehow it creates uh, an openness so that mm, if you think of it as an interface, right, the painting, my mind comes to it and I can kind of connect with it and kind of interface with you, I guess, and take what I want out of it or what maybe my past. Yeah. Like maybe you have something personal with the China. Obviously, I wouldn't know that. But maybe there's some embedded openness in there. So when I look at it, it makes me feel things about the China that come from my past. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. At least we hope so, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and painting is so complicated in a way because there's so many things going on all at once. The film kind of unfolds over time, so you kind of ride it. Yeah, that's... Um, what the original meaning of the sculpting in time of Tarkovsky's book comes from. It's like he is describing the time span of a film with this term, actually. But I reinterpret. Um, I put it. Wait, what was the last thing you said? I couldn't hear. Um, so the original title of yeah. his book, Sculpting in Time, he takes this title to describe like the time span of a movie which a painting doesn't have but for me there is the time span of of just painting for one to two months yeah you go through it yeah right the artist goes through that time and and then when you look at it i mean that, that's the thing painting I feel like, like imagine the difference between going into a gallery and seeing a painting and being like, experiencing it. And then imagine living with this painting, like having this with you on the wall in your home or wherever, right? And you see it every day. Then it's a whole, there's so many, you know, you get that initial reaction to a painting. Ah, no, that's not the right way. Like I come and I look at these and I'm going to get something from it. But there's so much there, right? So if I lived with one of these paintings and I saw it for years, it would just, um, these things would grow and come out and it would become really personal. And um, yeah. I don't know why I brought that up. I just. Maybe if you did a painting in some years, a painting. Yeah. Would be in the painting. Yeah. <laughs> I have paintings that are in my mind f that were on the wall when I grew up. And it was weird because, um, and I don't have to include this in the thing, but my mom died, right? And I got all the artwork. And it was weird going through the paintings because some of them had been on the wall. And I remember being in the room, barely looking at it, but for years and years and years and years. And one was this painting of this girl with these big eyes and the tear, and it was just always there. And when I saw it, I haven't seen it in so long, I was just like, wow. Like, it was so much a part of me. Was this recently? Yeah, it was like about two years ago, because I go through all the stuff. I put it all in storage. and. It's hard to get rid of things because they have this, I, I don't know if it's nostalgia. There's this one object, is this wooden carved Chinese man. I can't get rid of it, you know. It's just, I just remember when I was five years old and I would look at it every day when I passed by it. Barely, you know, you barely notice these objects. Like, I'm sure this China. Anyway, I think I have to read this book. Yeah, it's, it's so great. And I also what I really like too is the film Nostalgia. Nostalgia. I didn't see it, but it's another film. I he see. did, yeah. Yeah. It's so good. It's um, a place in Italy, 
and this summer I just had like one week where I could go anywhere because of several lockdowns and yeah. I decided to go to Tuscany and to visit all the sites of its film. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. You, you kind of figured out where. Yeah. Did you get it from a book or you just watched the film and figured it out? Um, you can, there are some nerds online. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> they, like. they write it on Wikipedia. <laughs> But That's a great pilgrimage. Yeah, I, I really had to do this somehow because Arizona seemed so far away this year and I was like completely captured in, in this series and in, in painting this. So I kind of, the only film that he made in Italy and I had the chance and to you're go. And you're close, Munich is yeah. close. What was that like, see, standing in a place that you had watched in the film? It's really cool. C comparing the two. Yeah, it's, it's kind of surreal because these places are so beautiful and not very touristic. They are just like these old churches um, on a hill with no, with no path leading to it. They are just like on, on the grass. and. I don't know, and there's another cloister without the roof, so you go in and you can just see the sky. It's really cool, it, was, it gave me just another feeling for the movie. It's such a great way to explore a film in a way, to actually go to the sets. I've never heard of anybody yeah. doing that, you know? This is how I work mostly. It's, for example, for the Montauk project, I had read the novel Montauk by Max Frisch. Max Frisch is the Swiss uh, writer. And because of this novel, I wanted to go and see Montauk. And when I was there, I thought, okay, this is a good place because I only, I can decide if I'm going to do something with the place or not um, when I'm there, not before. But I can be interested in a place because of like fiction or a film or something that wakes my interest and then I'm going there and then I, did, I know actually if I'm going to do something or not. How did you, um, how did this develop, this sort of algorithm where you, you, something inspires you and then you go to the place and then you explore the place, then you make compositions. When did you start doing that in the beginning? Because I, I imagine you had drawing and painting skill, right? You probably had it from a young age. When did you start going into this other realm? I think for me, places have become just a very important thing because when my parents split up, they sold my childhood home, which is crazy, but somehow this kind of broke my heart because I, this home was just loaded with memory and with I was not um, sad because of them breaking up, I was just sad because of the house. So this house like reappears in these paintings, it's in the back there. Is it on fire? I said it's on <laughs> fire. And but there I understand. Is, it's just like this photo on the wall with the house and yeah I think sometimes when you really feel comfortable somewhere or like I was obsessed with this longing of a place and then being there in real life and to compare the feeling of one wanting to go there and the experience in, in real life. And this is the only way to do it, just like to get an idea of something out of maybe a film or fiction and then going and then comparing. Have you ever gone back to visit the family house yes. that you lost? Yes. No, what was that like? It was 
so bad because a young family bought it and they destroyed all our garden. We had this wild garden and they made everything like just plain and it's <laughs> just not the same. They're no. making it their own. But I ha my my parents planted an apple tree when I was born and this is still there. It's so weird. I I'm, I'm always thinking about breaking in and just getting all the apples from my <laughs> It's <laughs> kind of overwhelming thinking about it, you know. We had a house in my family. Uh, on Seagate in Brooklyn. Really? Yeah, right on the water, right next no. to the lighthouse, and it was like the family house. And it had um, a main house, and then it had four separate apartments. And everybody lived in those apartments. Like, whenever you were in trouble, or you were in between things, like school, or breakups, or something, you'd live in one of those apartments. So that house was like our I don't know. It had so much meaning. And we all dream about it. And when my grandfather died, and well, my grandmother sold it because we all left and she couldn't manage this massive house. She sold it. And uh, it was just devastating, you know? Like if they still, if that house was still in the family, I'd be living there right now. Did and you go back there? I tried to go about eight years ago, but you can't get in to Seagate unless you live there. It's a, ah, you have it's to go coast. through a gate because oh, okay. it's just preserved. Um, it would be really weird to go there. It's so deep inside me, just all those little things like being a little kid and sleeping and the lighthouse was next door. So just sleeping and seeing the red light go every, just the light in the room going and the foghorn and walking outside in the back and you know the ocean was right there in our backyard you would have loved it <laughs> yeah I I'll, think so. I'll send you pictures yeah. okay there's not even that many pictures and there's no video really there's and, some film and which year did your grandma sell it like 91 or something wow. so there's no okay. digital imagery it's i took film of it. I'll, so, I'll show you, yes. you'll, um, and we all have dreams about the house still to this day, where there's like more rooms or like a tidal wave coming in, you know, uh, sorry, I'm like telling you too much about me, no, but this is why I like yeah. this, we're just talking for real, because it's like, it's hard to get at these deep things, right, you just see the work and you're like, Oh, that's great, whatever. But I want to, to me, there's something special about being an artist and devoting your life to exploring your thing. And everybody has a different quest or a different unique approach. And yours is, it's very fulfilling and requires a lot of contemplation. I imagine you need a lot of alone time. Yeah. Like something can disrupt that, this level of contemplation. You know, how do you balance out like the two? I guess you have your studio, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm trying. That's not always, I can do this always, but I'm trying to be in the studio seven days a week. So I'm sleeping very long and I'm working till late night. And I really get calm when I realize that the outside is getting calm and that there are no more people outside. And I always need somewhat like an open end so that I can go into and just paint. But if I know, okay, there is an appointment at 6 p.m., I can't even start. Can't go in, yeah. I, so how do you create this open time? You know, you're in a city, so there's a lot of things going on. There's music. I mean, right now there isn't, but I'm just saying in general there's music. There's art exhibitions. People are inviting you to things. You know a lot of people. So how exhibition do you openings are something like my lunch break. <laughs> They are in the evening and because you work at night. Yeah, because I start in the afternoon and work till late night. This is like 
in the middle and I, I can manage to go to, to an opening and then I would return to the studio, work till midnight because I think what's important is to just to keep a routine and not to ha have different hours every day. For me it is like this, I need like nine to ten hours every day and it would be cool if they were like from two to midnight or three to one a.m. or you know. I always admire that, I can't do that. You can? No, I'm the type of person who, I've always tried I've never been able to do that. The way I work is, it takes me so much to get in there, and then once I'm in there, I'll just stay for 36 hours. Like, wow. I'll sleep there, I'll stay. Because I know that it takes a lot for me to start, and uh, I just won't sleep. So I work in these spurts, where I just go, 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 and then it's not the most healthy thing in the world. Yeah, but, but it's just who I am. Actually, I've this would be like the best to paint yeah. this like in one thing, but I just have to sleep sometimes yeah. <laughs> in one month. But I've always wanted to f do a routine. I've tried. It's very hard for me. And this was, I, I kind of had to learn this because I was starting to study painting very early. Uh, I was really young and in Germany at the Art Academy most students tended to be older when I started so most um, students had a job before and then they decided to become an artist and so they were really they knew what they were doing and I was just so young and I came to the art school and we don't have anything to do there you know mm -hmm. it's just like this different system. You can do everything. You can go to classes, you can like um, work with ceramics or sculpture. You can do anything, everything, but you don't have to do anything. And there's all this freedom. And this was really hard for me. So I really had to learn to put a routine for me together because if everything, you, you are young, you can go to parties, you can do everything, mm -hmm. you don't have to learn, you can learn, you don't have to paint, you can paint. Like this was kind of a struggle. And then this was just a good way for me to, to deal with this, to have my own routine. Of course, I can have an exception for like, if there is a birthday or if I want to go and see a museum show, there are, it's still not f that fixed. Yeah. But I had to build something like a routine because people who are not working as artists, they think Alina is free every time. Yeah, p people this don't is so understand. Hard, yeah. I always tell people we're working all the time. Artists are always working. Yeah. Like there's no stop. There's no like nine to five, because you might even work, in your case, whatever four to midnight. But even when you're out, you're still going. Yeah. It, it doesn't really end. You experience all these things when you're making art, and um. I don't even know how to talk to anybody about them. And then I meet somebody like you and I'm like, oh, I, she gets it. You know what I mean? She understands that. And it's, I mean, most artists do, but a lot of artists work differently, right? So, and there's some things that relate to you and your process and your work. I'm also inspired by architecture. And, and then that in-between space, that threshold or it's almost like a portal you're creating a kind of portal that's cool there's this one Star Trek episode <laughs> from the old art Star Trek I don't remember which one and it's really cheesy you know <laughs> it's the old Star Trek you know and um, 
in it there is this portal, there's this doorway. They go to a planet and there's this other advanced civilization and I think they're gone and there's a portal. And the portal's sentient, it's like an artificial intelligence. It's like a rock face and in the rock face it's a different place and it keeps flashing to different, like it'll be like a snow planet and then a oh, desert okay. planet. Yeah. And, a, and when they jump in, they're in that space. So I, that's how I think of it, this whole idea of um, that place that doesn't exist where I am now, but if I jump in there, I'll be there. So what did you think of um, what did you think of the movie Solaris, like the concept that the planet itself was a kind of consciousness? Um, well, okay, this is I know. difficult. <laughs> I, I'm just, I love, the, I love, I read a lot of science fiction. I love science fiction and, and that's such an amazing concept, right? That a whole planet could be a conscious entity. I guess some kind of an entire... It's just the mass that's surrounding the space station and having this influence of the consciousness of the people in the space station, right? Yeah. If I remember this right. And she is just like... She is only in his memory. I think, but she's there as a person, so she's like the material. She's there, but she's ma she died actually like 10 years ago. How do you say it? If someone becomes... Uh, I guess we would say she was manifesting. Yes. Like the planet somehow manifested his wife, right? Yeah. And, and I think he went on the trip because of his wife, right? Wasn't that one of the reasons? I don't remember. I it's been a long time. Yeah. I think he was really sad. This was something he could not come over with. And somehow, I don't remember how she came, but she was there and he was freaking out because she was real and not real at the same time and... Was the planet using their memories to try to communicate with them? Is that what was going on? No. You're never really sure, right? It's never Yeah, it's, it's, it's just... Um, or it's I just think there is not an explanation for Solaris. I think they are on this space station to do the research about Solaris, which is always in a distance. But I'm not sure if the, these strange things that happen are because of this planet. Okay. And that resonated with you. I remember it's all these interiors. Yeah, and, and then you see out the window, and the planet is kind of. The way they described it was like there's all this movement, this slow movement of the terrain and the waves and I mean, yeah, it's pretty cool. You kind of capture that. Do you think you'll ever make a film? I would love to. Just for curiosity's yeah, sake. I would love to, but I'm still like the process of making a film would require so many people. I'm like more the person who is alone in the studio. You know, I'm not... Maybe this, this might change someday, but for now I can't imagine to work with, <laughs> with a, a crew lot of people. people. How would you yeah. get them to... So what's next? You have this sort of the Arizona location. Do you already have a new location that's spawned that you're working on? Or is there more to explore here? I will continue working on the Arizona series when I'm back in Munich. So I'm not sure yet. There are two more paintings for sure, but 
I'm a little bit autistic, so <laughs> kind of. Yeah. I always want each series to have 10 to 15 paintings. And in this special case, I was thinking seven could be nice too because Tchaikovsky made seven films like in his life, so this would be nice, but then it would not fit in my like general concept of a series with ten paintings. So I'm I'm still thinking if this is a series with seven paintings or if I'm going to do ten. So follow the Tchaikovsky. Yeah, maybe. And then, um, yeah, I have a new place. Um, I want to do a series based in Florida. And I'm still like working the concept out in my, in my mind. So there, I don't have something to tell about this series at the moment, but I already know where it's based and I already have some rooms to fill but I don't know yet how I will fill them or how, what I will change or what interventions will be there. What was the um, inspiration to Florida? Was it a book or a film? Oh, and there were several. The, um, the Florida Project is it's this movie, it's very recent. I like this a lot. And then, like, you know, there are a bunch of films, and especially the Truman Show, I think it's becoming kind of like up to date again in, in a weird way. And maybe I will. I, I don't know yet, but maybe I could just like, because I know the title of the series, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be in German or in English. Normally all the titles are in English, but I kind of like the sound of the German version, which would be Florida Räume, which means Florida rooms. So I would paint rooms that I found in Florida and I'm thinking to fill them like these stage settings, actually what the Truman Show, which was filmed there, is too. But I haven't thought further. This is all I know right now. <laughs> I've been going to Florida. Sorry? I've been going to Florida every six weeks. Really? Yeah, my son lives in Florida. You have a son? Yeah, I, was I didn't know you that. Didn't know that? No. He's grown up. He's a man. He's 24. Wow. What's his name? Dimitri. And where is he? He lives outside of Orlando in uh, Winter Park. And um, so I've been going there every six weeks during the pandemic, which has been really cool in a way. I actually like flying during this time because everything is empty. Um, it's right up your alley, as we say. Because you go to the airport, nobody's in the airport. You fly on the plane, nobody's on the plane. And I think airports have that weird quality that you describe where they're um, like something like uh, JFK. It's like a futuristic vision according to 1970. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And I find airports always have this futuristic architecture even though it's like futuristic according to a specific time. I also like how everybody's kind of in limbo because they're not in their real life. They're in this weird in-between life. So whenever I fly, I actually try to go early to the airport because I really like that whole weirdness of it, you know. And yeah, there's a word in Germany, a nichtort. Okay. Which means a non-place. Yeah. Was, do you have something? Like we would just say it literally. Okay. A no place, a non-place. Yeah. But Florida is a strange... Well, Florida is very big. There's a lot of different places and they're all very different. You know, if you're in northern Florida or southern. Ah, I've been. I've yeah, been so you there. know, where did you go? 
um, to Miami and then with the car to Key West, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, because um, I've never been there, but I know yeah. Hemingway was there. <laughs> yes, um, we did this road trip last year. So we started at Key West and we drove to San Diego, to San Diego in California. Wow. So That's um, all the southern states. And Amazing. Yeah, I've done the trip across country before, a few times. Actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad and thankful that we did this actually last year <laughs> because this year it would yeah. not have been possible. Although I have a friend who rode a bike across country, wow. a bicycle during the pandemic. Really? Because he had nothing to do, so he thought, I'll just go see the country. And he said it was empty, the whole country was empty. He was How like, long as was if he had the whole world to himself. And it took him beautiful. months, like four, five months. Wow. It's like Forrest Gump, but he was running. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. What about Germany or places in Europe? A lot of these places that you are connecting to seem to be here. Yeah. In North America. I think I grew up in Germany and there are so many influences from the US. So I grew up and I used to watch American movies, I read American literature. So I never went there, but my, my best friend from kindergarten and elementary school, they came to Germany during the Yugoslavia war and when the war was over Germany didn't keep them so at this time Clinton gave some visas to refugees from Yugoslavia and they were sent to Arizona that's the friend I was visiting two years ago in Arizona so the first time that I ever went on a plane <laughs> was me all alone like I, I did this flight where my parents gave me to a stewardess and the stewardess would give me to another stewardess like I was nine years old and they put this red bag around my, <laughs> my That's neck. That's amazing. You flew alone at nine yes, years old? Yes, to Arizona. I wonder if that would happen nowadays. Sorry? I wonder if that would happen today. I don't think so. It was yeah. before 9-11, so I was able to go into the cockpit or, um, above the Arizona Yeah, desert. they're so nice to you when you're a little kid. Yes. Yeah. So I think it was really a big, it made a big impression on me to see this Wild West kind of, it, it's so different from, so different from, from Munich. Anything. But still the America that is still so familiar to me is like more like the East Coast area and I think this comes from, from movies and I'm so I was thinking about this a lot and I think it's the first time I came to New York I was here and I thought wow I'm in New York and this is a foreign place to me but it doesn't feel foreign at all. It feels so familiar and I'm a stranger here and it's still so familiar. So it's, it's kind of this mixture of the imagination that I could only have because of fiction and the real um, experience again. And I think this is, has also something to do with these places of longing that I was trying to find and so it came that most of these places that were an inspiration for my series were here, but I would never say that I will only do like American places. It could no, be. No, I was just, but I know that there's something here that resonates with you. Yeah. I wonder if you had to pick a place in Germany that would resonate in the way you found with these locations. What kind of place that would be in Germany that has this kind of I was thinking about this and I would love to go and explore like the old 
parts in Germany like DDR? Do you say DDR? Yeah, was? I went to. I've been to Dresden. Yes. Before and there was definitely it was very weird for me. Yes, because it's the architecture for me too. Yeah. is it's kind of has a kitsch kitschiness to it. Yeah, I guess that the uh, GDR had a kind of is that am I saying it right? DDR. Yeah. Yeah, they had that kind of kitschy architecture, and there was a massiveness and a bleakness to it and it's weird yeah it's like as weird as Montauk or <laughs> yeah um, yeah Dresden and yeah. then they had this old big museum area which looked like something from the 18th or 19th century but it was more of the new architecture that was around I've uh, never been to Dresden but yeah. I think I also would lo love to go to the small villages and see these typical German things or like when I was a kid people used to have like party rooms in their basements they would all have a bar and a crazy mm. wallpaper and would mix cocktails with the blue curacao okay. you know and sometimes they also had this tisch tennis table ten yeah, yeah. tennis yeah so like really weird things yeah. or stuffed animals on the walls and stuff like this yeah. I think it's, it's not so beautiful but I would be interested in maybe finding these places it's that still look like in the 90s, 80s, 90s so. but you're right there's no film I guess if I grew up and I was seeing films from the GDR and you saw all these weird interiors and basements and then it would resonate with me. So it's really like, in a way it shows how amazing fiction is, like film, art, photography, yeah, how much of an impact it, it has. It opens the world. Like it really does, right? Like I've always wanted to go to Tokyo and Japan. I, I have never been, but I really want to go. To and where? To Japan. Yeah, it's Tokyo. Nice. And part of the reason why I really, really want to go, and I've always had this draw or nostalgia, was from reading books by, uh, what is it, Miracom? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, just reading those books at a young age and like, yeah, I love his work. You would like it too, I think. Yes, I, I, yeah. I love it. <laughs> so, I think you had a book when I was there in your studio. Maybe, I'm, I'm always like, I'm constantly yeah. listening to audiobooks while yeah, painting. me too. So I might not have read it, but I've definitely listened to a lot of his I books. I kind of remember us talking about it. You definitely have a weird studio. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> How did you wind up? First thing, it blows my mind that that was turned into studios. It's a bridge, right? Yeah. What is it, a ramp? It's a, it's a ramp where, where bikes and pedestrians can walk into the park that is closed. It's just so weird because it's like they converted the, the ramp into studios and the studios get, the oh, height yeah. gets smaller and smaller and smaller because of the ramp. Yeah, I had a very small one. But I hope, I really would love to stay there. But is it subsidized? Like, is it free or...? No, it's pay. not free, but compared to New York rents, it's almost free. <laughs> like, so we pay yeah. a l less than something that I would rent directly from a landlord would be. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunities in Munich for artists. No. You know? Well, I mean, there were spaces there. But there are. Maybe I'm coming as an outsider and I had access to things that other yes. people don't because they like gave me that studio. Remember yeah, that that's so great. But I imagine if I were there... But the studio you had, I think this, this place, or was your studio in the place where the exhibition was too? Remember that building on Merriam Platz yeah, or close yeah, by? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they gave me a studio. There. Yeah, I think this building doesn't exist anymore. No, it was only a year-long yeah. project. I had such a great time there. Plus, I did that film where I explored Munich, kind of like you were talking about. Yeah. I want to do that with other cities, too. 
I was going to do it with Oslo when do I went. Do you have also plans for the next magazine? Where it should yeah, I have plans with my work, I have plans with the magazine. So I was going to, after Munich last year, I went to Istanbul for a week. Yes. And I was with this gallerist and we, I went there with her and we met with the Istanbul Biennial director and the plan is to do uh, Vector Istanbul and have it launch in the Biennial in nice. 2021. Yeah. But uh, so I was supposed to go back this winter for a month and live there and visit the artists and I'm not, uh, it doesn't seem like I'm going to go, so I don't know. When does the biennial start? 2021, so I don't know if we're going to make it. Right now, I just, it's on pause. But Istanbul is amazing. Yeah. And I really like the idea of doing it there. So that's the next, that's one of the next potential vectors. The other one is, um, I've always wanted to do Reykjavik. Oh, I've never nice been there. I'd never been there either, but I actually have, I went to a graduate school here, the School of Visual Arts in New York, and in my class of 30 people, we actually had five people from Iceland. So I have friends there, like, I can go anytime and do a vector. So I, I want to do that. I think it's a magic place, yeah. right, all the nature. And they, there's a road you can drive around the entire country. It's a one, highway that goes around. Road. Yeah. Ah. So I really want to do that. Yeah. One of my dreams is to go there in the winter when it's dark all the time. And they have an artist residency. So I'd like to do that. This is Vector. What made you choose to pursue this way of life, of being an artist? Um, I think I always knew that I want to paint somehow so I was like always painting but not like doing art but like a kid paints so I just wanted to go to art school because I wanted to paint but I didn't really understand what I was doing what choice I was making by doing so and I think I had to learn this at university but also when I finished it's like okay so now you finished uh, studying, but actually nothing changes. You are just now an artist. Yeah. And you kind of grow into this way of life, or as I mentioned, the routine that I tried to keep up, so to have some things to hold on to, because it's so good and it's so bad at the same time that you are completely free. And I always have to try to manage some things where I can just hold on to. So that I always wanted to paint is something different because it's just about the joy of, of painting and the joy of colors and the process. But I did, I was a child, right? So I didn't understand what it really means to be an artist as a profession or to make a living out of this. But now I, I can't imagine something else. Like, like could you like do it's anything the else greatest though? job of all. Yeah, <laughs> I, feel, I feel the same. I mean, it's, it's not really a job, is it? It's like um, something else. Yeah, it's, it's just like the way of life, yeah. or I don't know. You're like How a monk. You <laughs> <laughs> right. I remember visiting your studio, you were exploring some different things, like you were making some small works in, for a book, or what was it you showed me? You showed I, me these small... Yeah, the, I, I, I was, um, when I was doing the residence program in New York, from 2017 to 2018, I was doing an artist in residence program at NAS Foundation. Yeah, in, nice. in that's how you met. Genau. Yeah. Ah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I love Genau. <laughs> you can say Genau. <laughs> um, and I came here, and I didn't know then that I would like find a gallery here and. So I was only working on in small 
paintings and on paper because I thought I would bring everything back. Yeah. I have to bring everything back to Munich. And this is a series of 40 paintings and they are all houses um, along one road. And I made a book with these paintings because for me it's more like the series is one work and these are all houses close to Roscoe, which is upstate New York. And I found this place um, because when there was no Google Earth yet, or like no Google Maps, the map makers would put hidden mistakes in their maps, such as paper towns. That's also the name of the series. So they would invent Eglo, which is, I think, their initials. And Eglo does not exist, but it, on the map is, it's close to Roscoe. And if they would find another map published by someone else that also has Eglo in it, they would know that this was like a case of copyright infringement. And they could sh just say they stole our map or they have... So it was... So you found these anomalies? <laughs> yes. And, and those are the houses. And I went there, and where this should be, there's this road leading to Roscoe, New York, actually. And I just took the road because it's very typical um, New England style houses along the road. But for me, it has both, like they are super familiar and they are strange at the same time again. And so I just rebuilt Aglo, which does not exist, with only the facades. I was only painting the facades of, of each house, so it's more like a kind of a Potemkin village. And I did the 14 paintings, and they are all in this book. And it started with this strange anomaly and these maps. Yes, yeah. Let's, I just want to look around with you a little bit, yeah. and then we can stop. Um, there's the house. <laughs> <laughs> this was the first painting of the Sculpting in Time series of the large scale. You definitely have the symmetry. Yeah. And you start with the symmetry and then you kind of break it. You know what I mean? You kind of... You mean it. like this? Yeah, there's a symmetrical thing that you do with your work from, but then you kind of rupture it as you go out. Maybe that's something that you like. You like almost like you want me to start off like, okay, this is normal. But then it's like, oh wait, no, it's not normal. Oh no, it's even less normal. Oh no, <laughs> it's yeah. fucked. You know, <laughs> like there's something about that journey. Yeah. Oh, it's normal. But then you look deeper and you're like, no, 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 this is something strange. Because if it, you just got strange right off the bat, it would be less interesting or if you just had normal the whole time. You know what I mean? It's something about this realization that... Yeah, I also like if you can just like explore things or kind of can get lost in a painting. And that's why I always quote on this one too. This is a painting that appears in Solaris. I know this painting. It's, it's Proge. Yeah. Hunters in the Snow. And I think you can so get lost in this painting. The original is in Austria in Vienna. Where's the China? The now? China, I, I, I took it. Yeah, but now I, it's going to really, you'll never be able to throw it yeah, away. Yeah, <laughs> I only have like four plates left. But how do you call the thing where you put the eggs in? Uh, you mean the soft boiled eggs? I don't know what that's called. Yeah, I have 20 of them oh because God. we never used them. So yeah, everything is, is broken, but like 20 of the eggs. Next time we come to Munich, we're going to have soft boiled eggs. <laughs> yes. We're going to eat them out of those. Okay, we can do Because nobody will ever do it. It'll be the last time. <laughs> okay, we'll do that. Cool. We don't have to talk about each one. I just want to kind of look at them. 
actually, I noticed, oh, this is kind of wild. Is that the same house? No. No, this is from the Montauk series, from the Montauk project series, the other series in the exhibition. And this architecture I took from the Parish Museum of Art, but it changed the architecture. So I think the window is only like this mm -hmm. normally, but I really wanted her to look inside, so I just stretched it. Okay. And the house is um, the house of the Grey Gardens. Do you know the story? It's, it's in the Hamptons, and there were these two crazy ladies living in the house and I think the the taxes for the property are very high there mm -hmm. and the mother got divorced and I think what her husband gave her would only cover the taxes. So um, one of them was the niece of Jackie Kennedy. That's why they got kind of famous and I think also Andy Warhol went there and did a film with them. And But there's another documentary film who was there before Warhol came, which is super famous and it's so weird. Did you go there? I, I went there yeah. and this was like a building site. So mm -hmm. they took down the old house and ran away to it. So that's it. It's, it. it's over. Yeah, it's over. Yeah. But they were kind of messy, you know? It, mm -hmm. It's really... There were these characters living out in the Hamptons. Yes, that? and like all the neighbors yeah. hated them because they wanted everything to look and so like good. And the artists would hang out there. And like, yeah. yeah. I get it. <laughs> so I, I just put this in the museum and have the mother of the muses watch them <laughs> from Very the outside. Cool. I'm trying to remember, you know, I don't think I saw any of these when I was in your studio. I'm trying to remember. If no, they, they are new. Yeah. I got a lot of good pictures that day. I'll probably post them. Like when I run this interview, I'll probably do, obviously it's audio. So. Yeah. But um, I'll probably do a YouTube and I'll just have some slideshow. Mm -hmm. cool. I'm going to take some pictures today too, if that's okay. Sure. These I did upstate two weeks ago just during the quarantine. Oh, because you're in quarantine. Yeah. You can just hold them. Had a lot of time there. <laughs> and these are all details from the large paintings. It's nice, actually. That we had this idea to play one music piece of Bach one time every hour in the exhibition, which we didn't do right now because we were talking, as, as a um, setting for the sculpting and time paintings. And I really like this. It's, it's a music piece that plays a prominent role in Solaris too, in the Tarkovsky movie. And it's a harmony that contains of three simultaneous, sim simultaneous um, <laughs> <laughs> melodies, which I think has kind of a reference to the paintings too, because I was telling you how I build them out of the place and the idea and like the memories. And so there are always three things coming together in the paintings and this is why I really like to have the Bach piece played. One, we can listen to it later. I'd like to, yeah. yeah. Because it probably adds another element from the film, another layer. Yeah.
I don't want him to be too formal, just kind of like weird and quick. That's nice. This is from the movie? I have to watch the movie again. Yes. I haven't seen it in 15 years. <laughs> yeah, you also have to watch the other movies. What's up? Did you watch another movie he did? That's the only one. Because I read the book. Yeah. So when I read the book, I was like, oh my god, there's a film. So, like it was the story that drew me to the film that I know Tchaikovsky is one of the famous directors and I probably should watch everything, but, <laughs> but I was more drawn from the science fiction book. Yeah. Um, there. Are there any contemporary films that inspire you, you know? Oh, I, I love David Lynch. Yeah. Did you watch, did you watch Twin Peaks? Yes. Did you watch the new? Yes. Wasn't it amazing? Yes. It that, was so weird, but so good. It's so, I love the new version, like the yeah. 20 years later. And do you remember that one episode where it was almost just pure video art, like almost nothing happened narratively? Yeah. I, I want to rewatch that, you know. Which one? Remember in the new series of Twin Peaks, he had this like one episode where the whole episode was just abstraction, visuals. It was kind I of... I think it was the nuclear explosion. Yes, yeah. It was incredible, I thought. Yeah, it was really strange, but good. That concludes episode four of the Vector Interview podcast. I want to thank Alina Grossman for participating on the project. It was an honor to talk with her. You can see the work from her exhibition on the gallery website, freedomgallery.com slash Alina Grossman. You can find out more about Alina on her website, alinagrossman.com. I have posted the links here and on the Vector website. For information about our current and future projects, go to vector.bz. And you can find us on Instagram at three underscores vector three underscores. If you like the podcast and you're feeling generous, we ask that you make a one-time contribution for the episode. 50% of the proceeds will go to the artist. You can also support all of the Vector projects by becoming an ongoing subscriber on our Patreon at patreon slash vector productions. I am Peter Gregorio. You can find me on Instagram at Peter underscore Gregorio. And if you want to see my artwork, visit my website at petergregorio.com. Javier Barrios can be found at javierbarrios.com. And his Instagram is underscore Javier underscore Barrios. All of the music was generously provided by Liz Kosak. You can find her and check out her projects at zardcom.com. The title drops were provided by my comrade, an extraterrestrial German artist, Sophie Linder. Thank you, MK, for help with research and writing. And our cover art is by the artist, Philip Grosinger. You can find his work on his Instagram at philip underscore Grosinger. And a big thank you to our producer and editor, Todd Tracy. I will leave you with this quote from Alina Grossman. I don't avoid creating new narratives in my paintings. I just don't want to illustrate the existing narratives, the myths and stories about a place. Rather, I want to create a space for association so new stories can emerge. I try to fill the rooms with life. You can't see people in my paintings, but you can feel their presence. So one can say I paint images of a utopia as it could have been. Thank you for listening to Vector. Bye.